In this video, we're going to introduce the use of calculus in physics. I'm not going to spend time showing you how to evaluate integrals or derivatives. You can easily get that knowledge elsewhere. The hard part about calculus is not evaluating the expressions, but understanding why you're evaluating those expressions. My goal here is to give you a feeling for how calculus works. We're not going to exhaustively cover the entire subject, but hopefully this survey of the basics will help you figure out the rest of it on your own with a little bit of critical thinking. Let's begin with an example. The length of a straight line is given by the simple Pythagorean theorem. By contrast, the length of a curvy line is given by a complicated looking formula involving integrals and derivatives. In the next few minutes, we'll see how the curvy formula follows simply and naturally from the straight line formula, and then go on to see several more examples. We'll start with something even simpler. The first thing we learn in physics class is constant velocity motion. Displacement is given by the velocity multiplied by the time interval. But what about varying velocity? The trick is to zoom in on a very small time interval dt. Over this very small time interval, the velocity is approximately constant, so the constant velocity formula can be used to find the very small displacement dx, which happens over this time interval. The total displacement can be calculated as the sum of many small displacements obtained by splitting the total time interval up into many small time intervals. That's what an integral is. The small quantities dx and dt show up elsewhere as well. If we consider the position plotted versus time, we can again zoom in on a very small time interval dt. Then the graph looks approximately like a straight line, and the slope is dx over dt. This is the definition of the derivative. So taking the derivative of position gives velocity, and integrating velocity gives the change in position. This relationship between position and velocity is the same as the relationship between any function and its derivative. We can take any function f in an interval from a to b and compute the total change in f by integration. We split the interval from a to b up into many tiny subintervals and compute the change in f over each subinterval. In a single subinterval, f is approximately linear. So the small change df is easily computed using the slope of the line. The total change in f is simply the sum over all the small changes. Summing over many small things is what we mean by integration. Now we're ready to go back to our first example. We want to compute the length of this curve. We'll begin by writing it as the sum of many small lengths. The reason is that after we zoom in on a very small interval, the curve is approximately straight, and the Pythagorean theorem can be used. Substitution and some simple algebra gives us the complicated looking formula from before. Having mastered integration in one dimension, we can move to two. Don't worry, it doesn't get any harder. Our new task is to compute the area of this funny region. We begin with the simple observation that the total area can be written as the sum of many small areas. Each small region is just a box, and the area of a box is its base, dx, times its height, dy. Summing up all these little areas is just doing the integral. Often when there are two variables being integrated, you'll see two integration signs, but that's just notation. After two dimensions comes three. Let's calculate the total mass in this funny shape. This may appear daunting at first, but it's easy once we write the total mass as the sum of many small masses. Each small mass dm is the mass of a tiny cube. If the cube has volume dv, then its mass is its density, rho, times dv. Note that even if the density is a function of position, that function will be constant over our tiny cube if the cube is small enough. That's why this formula works, and that's why integration is so powerful. Finally, the volume of a tiny cube is the product of the lengths of its sides. Extra integral signs can be tossed in for embellishment, but they're kind of annoying, and writing them all the time gets old quickly. Well, that just about does it for integration. Let's go back to derivatives, where there's more to do. Remember that if we zoom in on any function near some point a, it will appear approximately straight, and the slope is given by the derivative at that point. 
For x values near a, we can use the point-slope formula to evaluate the function. Make sure you understand that this formula is the usual point-slope formula before moving on. We know that in reality the curve isn't really straight, and if we zoom out a little bit we can see it curve around a little. We can account for this in our formula by adding another term involving the second derivative. This is how I want you to think of second derivatives from now on. You should recognize these as the first two terms in the Taylor expansion, but I won't be going any, any further in the expansion in this video. The second order approximation of a function is especially useful when the first order term vanishes. This happens at local minima and maxima. Near a local minimum, for example, the function looks like an upward facing parabola. Clearly, this is the same as saying that the second derivative is positive. The opposite holds for local maxima. There's a really important physics application of this. Consider an arbitrary physical system with some sort of conserved potential energy as shown here. Newton tells us that the force in the system is equal to minus the derivative of the potential energy. This vanishes at the point A, which means that A is an equilibrium point. Let's use the second order expansion of V near A to see how the force looks for small displacements from equilibrium. A simple calculation gives us Hooke's spring force law with the second derivative of v playing the role of spring constant. Here's one last application. Imagine some object sitting at a distance r from the center of the Earth. The potential energy of that object is given by the minus 1 over r law. But if that object is near the surface, it's more useful to express little r as the radius of the Earth, big R, plus the height h above the surface. Since h is supposed to be small compared to big R, we can zoom in on the values of the potential by doing a first order expansion. You can compute this expansion by taking the derivative of 1 over R and evaluating it at big R. This is just the point slope formula we were using before. Now take the derivative of this with respect to h to get the force. Plugging in some numbers for this collection of constants, gives us the vanilla mg force law. I want to emphasize just how amazing this is. This calculation is essentially Newton's greatest discovery. The 1 over r law is used to describe the orbit of things like the moon or of satellites, while the mg law is used to describe apples falling from trees or any other terrestrial kind of phenomenon. We have shown that they are, in fact, the same law. That's why it's called Newton's law of universal gravitation.